So uh, with that, I am going to go ahead and turn things over to Rachel now. Thanks, Becca. <clears throat> Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Uh, so before we get started, just want to give a shout out to our funders, um, the Foundation for Pennsylvania Watersheds and the Colcom Foundation. And thank you all for joining us today. I know it's a busy time of year, uh, but we are really excited about this GAPS program and wanted to get things rolling. We are recording today, so feel free to share with your colleagues who might not have been able to make it. But we will be going over um, a few general 3RQ items before getting into the GAPS program because we see a lot of new names. So first we'll start off with just some general information. We'll cover the free tools that we have available, including the Waters database and our mapping tool. And then we'll get into the GAPS program and then open it up to a Q&A session for anything that we covered so far. So first we'll have Melissa O'Neill start us off. So I'll turn it over to her. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Um, I apologize at any time if I start to lose my voice, I'm kind of getting over a little bit of a sinus head cold, um, which causes some issues at times. Um, but really glad that everybody was able to join us and we hope that this recording gets around to other folks that weren't able to make it today. Um, we realize that a lot of folks are dealing with preparation for finals or are in the midst of finals week, um, which always creates a lot of uh, extra work for everyone. So to give a little bit of a background on our Three Rivers Quest project, um, 3RQ is just one of the many projects here at the West Virginia Water Research Institute. Um, it's essentially a collaborative network of um, our university partners and volunteer groups throughout the Upper Ohio River Basin. Um, we've been doing some routine monitoring since 2009. Um, we focused on uh, total dissolved solids. So one of the things that we were really interested in um, in that beginning time frame was trying to get an idea of what was causing some of the high salts that we were seeing in the Mon River. We started our sampling program and um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, expanded into the upper Ohio, adding in the Allegheny um, and of course the Ohio River. Um, we go out every uh, month and do monitoring at uh, various stations along the main stem and the mouths of major tributaries. Um, we do that with our uh, team here at WVU and our partner, 3RQ partner at Duquesne University um, and West Liberty University. And then we also uh, collaborate with various different watershed groups throughout the area who are collecting water uh, quality samples in more headwater locations and smaller streams and tributaries. Um, we have a data warehousing and mapping a component to 3RQ, which Rachel's going to talk about for us. Um, and we're really looking to try to um, utilize our GAPS program to really sort of tie things together in terms of getting more student involvement and support and helping to build the capacity of watershed groups. Um, just to give an idea of the geographic scope of where we're sampling, um, here you can see the outline for the uh, Mon uh, River watershed. Um, we've got our um, sampling locations that show up as different icons. Um, this uh, tool map that you're seeing is something that uh, will also be discussed later in the presentation. Um, but just to give you an idea of sort of like the geographic scale, um, you know, of the Upper Ohio River Basin and the various different water quality samples that we're collecting and our volunteers are collecting and other organizations are collecting as well. So in terms of our sort of our kind of roadmap um, for our 3RQ, um, we've got, you know, a lot of data coming in um, from various sources, whether it's our routine monthly sampling or more sporadic sampling done by watershed groups. Um, all of that data is going into our waters database um, and we make that available out to the public through our online maps um, so that anybody can get on and look at water quality data. One of the things that we really um, like to try to connect are data users. Um, so these could be, you know, watershed groups that are interested in um, looking at water quality data, um, potentially master's students or undergraduate students that are doing a project that are interested in data. And we really like to connect those data users back to the folks who collected the data because it really provides um, benefit in both directions in terms of 
knowing what's going on with the data. Um, and as I mentioned, the online maps are also available to the general public just to be able to get on and look at water quality in the upper Ohio basin. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel, who's going to give a little bit of a, a background on the actual database itself. And Rachel, it's all yours. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, our database manager, Lisa Barrera, wasn't able to join us today. So I'll be going, going over a couple slides. Um, so what is WATERS? It's a cloud-based database for water quality parameters. And it is open for any organization to use for free. Um, so the way this came about was watershed organizations that we had been working with often told us that there was limited space for them in the data world. They had difficulty managing their data because oftentimes they were um, just volunteer run um, or they might have limited funds for data management. So we stepped in to fill that gap. So a few highlights about the WATERS database. Number one, it can be viewed on Android, iPhone, and iPad. So that means that you can allow, you can upload data in the field. But primarily it is a data warehouse. So you can easily import and export the data. There are some visualizations built in such as graphs and reports, and you are also able to filter and query data. It's routinely upgraded with specific modifications uh, being requested by the users, depending on funding. Uh, but we are constantly going in and making upgrades um, as we have funds are, as well. Uh, and the data is uploaded via Excel templates, so it is very easy to use. And we have a dedicated person to uh, working with the database. So it's e as easy as reaching out to Lisa or one of us to get you started. The current parameters that are built into the database include lab and field values, which would also include SON data. So we have general water quality indicators, such as visual turbidity, um, current and previous precipitation, uh, metals, including a lot of AMD metals, chloride, bromide, um, halogens. We also have nutrients and biological parameters, including algae, diatoms, and bacteria. The data organization within the warehouse, you are able to query the data falling within either specified values, such as a pH range of two to six, or within spe specific date ranges. The data is output through uh, online viewing and also through Excel. And it also generates statistical summaries of the requested data. Sorry, my slides are advancing themselves. <laughs> um, but as you can see, this is really helpful for SON data. It will give you minimum, average, and maximum. And then as far as data visualization, this is just one example of a, uh, I believe it is, this is one of our sites actually, uh, but you can see a, a few different lab values all in one figure. And then it also breaks it down. So you have a figure for each of the values. So just to really explain where we stand with data, we strongly believe in connecting the data generators to the data users, which Melissa mentioned. And so with the data generators permission, access can be granted to allow outside users to view and download their data in waters. So it is a data warehouse, but it can also be used to share data through um, permission. So all data uploaded to Waters is also shared publicly through our online maps, which we're going to be going over, I think, in the next slide. Yes, so I will turn it over to Mel. And I'm now realizing that I didn't introduce myself, so I will do that before I turn it over. So I'm Rachel Spernack. I think it says Rachel Pell, I recently got married, um, but you can call me either. And I am a water resources specialist with the West Virginia Water Research Institute. And a lot of my work focuses on the Three Rivers Quest program. So with that, I'm turning it over to Mel. 
Okay, hi everyone. My name is Melissa Schaefer. Everyone calls me Mel. Uh, I'll be talking to you today about the three RQ maps that we have available on our website. So as Rachel was talking about the data that is uploaded to Wetters, it is, and it can be visually displayed through our three RQ maps. So these maps are available to the public, user-friendly, interactive, and easy to share. So when you access our website to navigate to the mapping tool, you land on our map hub page, uh, which gives you background to the data that's available in our mapping tool. Uh, this includes our routine monitoring for 3RQ, which can be displayed as monthly data or yearly averages. It also explains to you about our member data uh, from many different organizations. Um, yeah, and it also gives us background information on our targeted studies, which these are studies that researchers responded to citizen concerns and they developed focus studies and expanded monitoring to include additional parameters to provide a fast response to emerging water issues. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, story maps are also found on the Mapping Hub, uh, which they are a deeper dive into 3RQ's targeted studies. We've started creating these story maps a few years ago and really want to focus on creating more in the future because they're really a great way of conveying full stories of our targeted studies through maps, photos, and text. Uh, our most recent one is uh, diving into 10-year trends of the Mon River Basin. Uh, now you can go to the next slide, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So the once you get into the mapping tool itself, it includes layers from, sorry. <laughs> Did it skip a slide, Rachel? I'm sorry. Can you go back one? Story maps, no, okay. I lost my place. Okay, so yeah, the mapping tool is a convenient place for various sources of data all in one location. This mapping application allows us to see the greater uh, picture of the upper Ohio River Basin. Um, next slide, please. So how does it work? It's created with ArcGIS Online, which means that there's no downloads or logins required. It displays nearly 40 different uh, publicly available data sources um, from state and federal agencies, NGOs, and from our 3RQ data. And the important thing to remember with this is that the data is owned and maintained by its creator. So it's updated automatically in the tool and credit is given to the owner of the data sources such as a nonprofit organization or the DEP. So next slide, please. Data layers are organized in the mapping tool as what are resources, resource extraction, remediation, biological resources, and infrastructure. Uh, and these categories are included for the states of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Maryland. Next slide, please. So this slide here is an example of data shown out, shown throughout the Upper Ohio River Basin. And this is showing uh, uh, power plants of Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Uh, next slide, please. And then here's an example of a national data set that shows PFAS concentrations throughout the nation and percent natural land cover. Next slide. So some cool things about this map um, is that it's extremely interactive. So you can click on a point and a pop-up will uh, give you additional information. This example here is of our monthly 3RQ data from the Yakagani River, and it shows all the parameters that we test for. The pop-up generally displays the most recent data available, but you can also click through and look at previous month's data. Uh, next slide. So under the tools button in the top right hand corner, uh, there are a bunch of different tools. There's a measuring tool that can allow you to measure distance between points. You can also measure square area of an area of interest. And you can also change the units from miles to kilometers, feet, et cetera. Uh, next slide. 
There, you can also change the base maps in the tools button from you know, imagery to USGS maps, topographic maps, et cetera. Uh, next slide. Uh, also in the tools, you can add additional data that's not included in the mapping tool already. You can do this by searching in the toolbar. You can copy and paste a URL from a known source, or you can upload a file from your own computer. Uh, and finally, you can also print um, from this application. You can choose your layout and format. Next slide. So really, there's tons of potential for using this mapping tool. Uh, some of the applications are creating high quality maps for proposals and report, engaging the public in local waterways, identifying spatial trends, and investigating potential sources of water quality issues. As an example, we recently used this tool for uh, because we found high TDS values in one of our routine sampling sites. So we were able to look at the proximity of USGS gauge in the area, look at the data that they had, um, look at discharges from Pennsylvania and West Virginia DEP because the stream in question crossed state borders. Um, and also we were able to look at imagery and land use to really zoom in on the issue and to see what was going on. So next slide. So after working on this application for a while, it's finally ready to be used and shared. Uh, so as you're looking through this mapping tool, we'd really appreciate any feedback that you had or any additional layers that you think might be useful. There is a link to a form that you can fill out on the mapping tool itself and can also be found on our website. And finally, here's the link to access the mapping tool. And once you get to the mapping hub, there's also a quick start uh, video to help you, you know, navigate the tool. So thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Rachel so she can talk about the GAPS project or program. Thanks. Thanks, Mel. <clears throat> yeah, to sum up um, all of that background information that was covered and to kind of give you an idea of where we are coming from with this new GAPS program, um, so 3RQ not only implements routine monitoring, we also collaborate frequently with watershed-based groups, and we've been doing this for over 10 years. Uh, we work with the different agencies in West Virginia and Pennsylvania, and we also provide resources and research for specific needs. So 3RQ is a network, not an organization, so we all have our own like day jobs here at WRI. 3RQ is just a small part of what we do. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also have a lot of experience working with acid mine drainage, and this includes working with watershed groups in West Virginia to apply for federal 319 grants and implement uh, to construct AMD treatment systems. So kind of from all of this work we've been doing for so long, a lot of the conversations that kept coming back up were that um, watershed groups don't have the resources they need to really prepare to submit a grant. And this also came up with uh, our conversations with Foundation for Pennsylvania Watersheds. And we really just wanted to step in and provide an extra resource there by filling in um, assistance at the very beginning before you even would write the grant. So what is GAPS? It is assistance with collecting, managing, and analyzing data in preparation for a remediation funding request. That's what it is at its core. Um, we opened up the assistance last year for grassroots organizations and this year for small colleges and universities. And so again, this is really looking to fill that gap in funding to prepare for larger grants to actually accomplish remediation. And this could be federal, state, or private grants. Uh, this program is also geared towards non-point source pollution. So that would include things like acid mine drainage, sedimentation, um, fecal coliform, things like that. And just to make it even clearer, we created this little flowchart using the example of a 319 grant preparation process, uh, but it really could be extended to any type of grant. Um, this is just a really good example of 
a grant that needs a lot of preparation. So typically, uh, before you would even get started, you would have a watershed based plan in West Virginia or a watershed implementation plan. And this would cover all of the potential projects within your watershed. It would include sampling data, um, and it is a very large undertaking. A lot of the groups we work with in West Virginia have a watershed-based plan that is at least 10 years old that they're working off of. Well, but once you have that plan, then you can identify what project you want to work on next. So you have your project in mind, and then ideally you would collect new data, new more recent data on that specific uh, site. From that, you could really create a good budget and do some rough pre-engineering. And that would really set you up for a good funding uh, application. When this doesn't happen, a lot of the issues that we've seen include, um, you know, under budget usually, uh, especially if you're working with older data, you might miss a certain source that's come in. Um, a lot of things can happen. So uh, the projects that we've worked on have been broken up into multiple phases and just really not as successful as it could be. So good data is critical for successful projects. The services available through this program, uh, they include direct services and funding. And it really depends on the needs for the specific project and who we're working with. But uh, direct assistance could include assistance with field work uh, or possibly training students or others to do this field work. Um, and you know, that could be grab sampling or flow measurement collection or helping with the installation and management of data loggers. Uh, we can also coordinate with the analytical laboratory. We have a great relationship with PACE. We've been using them for over 10 years. Uh, data management, of course, with the Waters database and you know other um, spreadsheets that we have to do QAQC checks, things like that, and the grant searching and preparation at, towards the end of the project. Uh, and what I think a lot of you will be interested in is more so the funding for especially students analytical cost and travel. And we're putting out our maximum ask at $10,000. Additional benefits that will come with the GAPS program if you're successful would be, um, we will help you upload your data to Waters for long-term storage. And of course that's free um, and it will always be. And your data will also be published to online maps uh, we would be happy to work with your students if they would be interested in doing some mapping of their own or creating a story map. Uh, we would be happy to share anything that they create and integrate it into our tools. And then another really important benefit is 3RQ and the Foundation for Pennsylvania Watersheds will help facilitate connections with state and federal agencies um, um, with your researchers and students. So as I mentioned, the 2023 GAPS program was uh, to support grassroots groups or watershed-based groups. So these are just a few examples of the projects that we have still currently ongoing through that program, they include bank erosion monitoring, flood monitoring using some pretty cool technology, um, AMD source characterization and prioritization. And that is um, being done by Stream Restoration Inc on behalf of the West Wheatfield Township. So that's a pretty cool project too. And also general pollutant monitoring in larger river systems. Um, our next two GAP sessions, so they'll be occurring um, January and February. And if you registered for them, you'll be set. If not, you can go back and click on the registration and click those additional dates. Um, but our next two sessions will include presentations from some of our current GAPS program recipients. Okay, so the eligibility, the project needs to be within any of these highlighted areas. Your college doesn't necessarily need to be based out of it. So um, 
like for example, if you are located in Erie PA, which would not be part of the Ohio River Basin, but you're doing a lot of work um, near the Allegheny River, and that's where the project would take place, that's perfectly okay. So um, anywhere within the Upper Ohio River Basin that is going into these specified counties in Pennsylvania um, due to the interests of our funders. So the application, we encourage you all to fill it out. It is a very simple and quick application on Google Forms. Um, and we really, I'll go to the next slide, um, but we'll really be looking to evaluate them one by one. And most likely we will be reaching out to set up a meeting to learn more about your project. So these applications are kind of just a, a first start and then we will probably reach out to learn more. Um, we want to make it as simple as possible. So um, they'll be based, the application evaluation will be based on project readiness and the potential to leverage future funds. Uh, I made this nice little uh, graphic to really bring that home. Um, we're really looking to show our funders that these funds have a large impact and that they'll leverage uh, larger projects that will actually um, accomplish stream restoration. So we're hoping to kind of use this as seed funds to really accomplish something bigger. Uh, the applications will be accepted on a rolling basis. So first come, first serve, and we anticipate funding two to four projects. Okay, this is just some um, uh, links and ways to stay in touch. We do have a biweekly newsletter that runs uh, general news happening within the Ohio River Basin. So encourage everyone to sign up for that. And at this time, I'll open it to the Q&A. If you have questions about anything we've presented so far or general questions about 3RQ, we're happy to take them now. Uh, yeah, while other people are typing in the chat, I had a couple of questions myself. Um, and uh, my first question is about the 3RQ mapping tool. And I'm wondering if you could tell me in non-STEM terms what that data would be able to tell me about Fayette County, Pennsylvania, and or Point Mary in Pennsylvania, because that's where I live. So I'm like super curious about that and interested. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, there was just one thing that I was looking at that might be helpful to add is county lines, Rachel, into the mapping tool and possibly like national land cover data. But if you go to the map, once you open it up, you can zoom in and out to any area of interest. And then since you're looking specifically at Pennsylvania, you can toggle over to the Pennsylvania icon and it gives you all of the data that we have available for Pennsylvania in general. So you can start clicking through to see um, if you're looking at infrastructure, you can look at active landfills and then just kind of focus in on your hometown and see exactly, like, are there any close to your home or anything like that? Uh, also can give you biological resources if there's like clean water, trout fisheries near your home and stuff like that. So I think people can really learn a lot about their hometown if they, you know, come to the mapping tool and see, you know, what they're surrounded by. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Mel. Uh, we had another question pop up in the chat uh, from Robert, and they asked, are you looking for specific project based, which may be short term or long term monitoring, or a combination of both? That's a good question, Rob. Um, so while the 3RQ program itself does a lot of like long term monitoring on our, you know, surface waters, for the GAPS projects, we're looking for things that are more uh, short-term specific to um, getting that background data that you need to help your grant application for some sort of restoration project. So it would be a shorter term sampling. So, and we'd love to hear um, more information. If you have a particular site in mind, um, you know, feel free to just start talking. We're 
We've got a little bit of time left this morning. We wanted to leave a lot of time for discussion um, to hear about some potential ideas that folks have. So feel free to speak up. Uh, Rob says, thank you. And then Callie says, thanks. This is all great info. I'm excited to learn about Waters database. Any plans to add benthic macroinvertebrate data? Can you add the link to sign up for the newsletter in the chat, please, as well? So uh, benthic macroinvertebrate data is something that comes up a lot and something that we're definitely interested in. It would be a really, it would be a larger scale upgrade, um, a little bit expensive. So that's the reason why we haven't done it yet. Um, I'll let Melissa add anything, but I'll put the link in the chat to the newsletter sign up. Yeah, I know that like with just adding the water quality stuff in, it was really complex to do. Um, one of our challenges, I think, um, to be able to build something to add in the benthic data is that each of the different states that we work with <laughs> sort of deal with the, the benthic evaluation a little bit differently. Um, and there are some existing databases out there. I know like Isaac Waltling has a program um, that they, you know, do benthic sampling. Um, I think a short and easy sort of workaround for that is to be able to utilize the map so that we can overlay um, any existing benthic data that folks um, have out there existing in ArcGIS layers um, and be able to look at that visually next to uh, any water quality data that we have. Um, but at this point, we don't have um, open funding available to be able to just add in um, an expansion in the database itself for that benthic data. And I know it would probably be a pretty expensive and pretty um, complex thing to add in. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we haven't done it is there just hasn't been a great funding opportunity to go after to, um, you know, provide that funding to do it. Hope that helps. It's not a great answer, but at least visually we can look at the data side by side, you know, through the tool map, um, anything that exists in an ArcGIS layer, layer and be able to look at that. Does that help, Callie? Uh, Callie says, completely understand. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, you could always, um, you know, if, if there is a situation like that where there's a particular area that you're interested in, and you can visually see that there's water quality data available and benthic data available, um, you know, you can come to us and we can, you know, figure out who it is that owns that data, the water quality data, and get permission to be able to pull that data, you know, into an Excel format or something that you would be able to work with. Um, and the same thing on the benthic side. So, you know, looking to see who generated that initial layer and if that data is available um, you know, in a more raw format, if you've got a student or somebody that wants to work with it, um, that they would be able to do more analysis um, and correlate those data sets. Great. Um, I do not see any other questions in the chat right now. Um, while we're waiting to see if any more pop up, I'm going to share my screen really quickly just to give a little um, overview of what we have coming up. So bear with me, share. Okay, um, so we've got two um, different webinar series kind of going on. Uh, today's installment was the first of the three RQ roundtable ones. Uh, the third week of the month, we'll have our WVWRI seminar series, and the next one is, or the first one is on land and water reclamation. So that'll occur the third Thursday of the month, same time, same place, uh, different link though, because it's a different series. And I can include all of that in the follow-up email with a link to the recording, as well as a link to the slides. Uh, our second installment of the 3RQ Roundtable series is going to be on erosion and stormwater issues. The link that you use today to access the webinar is the same one that you can use to access 
any of the other 3RQ roundtable series um, occurrences. So there's that. And I'm not seeing any other questions. Rachel, Mel, Melissa, is there anything else you wanted to uh, share with this group before we end for today? Um, I wouldn't mind going around and just doing some introductions and hearing a little bit more from um, Robert, Joshua, and Callie just about, you know, what their interests are and what they're looking to maybe um, hopefully apply for for a GAPS project. Yeah, I'd be glad to uh, to speak briefly. Um, my name is Bob White. I'm with Penn West University here in California, so just, just over the border. And what we're looking at is the university owns about 100 acres, just a mile up from uh, from the university. And we have a significant stretch of uh, unnamed tributary to Four Mile Creek and to the Mon. And we've done some work with Partners for Fish and Wildlife here in Pennsylvania, and, and they're based out of, out of Penn West. We've worked with the Borough uh, of, of California and doing some stream restoration. And we're looking to do some monitoring and restoration on the, the stretch of the unnamed tributary that goes through um, this um, piece of property that we have. We're trying to develop into a, into a field station, uh, education, and, and just showing um, conservation practices. We work with the, the county soil and water. We work, with, uh, we work with the local high school. And so I'm just trying to get more information uh, as we start to develop our programs and we try to, to implement some monitoring and there are specific restoration aspects from, from erosion, to, uh, to run off from State Route 43, uh, which is really poor water quality. And so I'm just trying to get some ideas in terms of how maybe we can uh, utilize uh, the programs and, and the sources of funding that you have to help us uh, move us along. Yeah, that sounds like it would be a really good fit. Um, you know, we can help provide some funding for students to get out and do some sampling and get you guys the data that you need um, in order to go after those larger restoration mm -hmm. uh, projects. Yeah, and uh, we're really trying to get the, the students more involved and we're trying to connect the students then to the high school as well, mm -hmm. as well as with the community leaders in the borough uh, to kind of broaden that that reach out and just kind of interconnect everyone while we move forward with some some good restoration on the, on the stream itself. So thank you. Yeah, no, it sounds awesome. great. Bob, I think I'm familiar with um, the restoration that has been done there. Is that uh, located on the small park with the track around it? Right. Absolutely. Okay. That was done with uh, with um, Partners for Fish and Wildlife out of out of California, and they did a really nice job. Yeah, it looks great. And we do yeah. we do a lot of uh, stream restoration with them as well, and other projects in in the area with with PennDOT as well. Very cool. Thank you. Um, and Melissa, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but would that parcel of land potentially be a brownfield that could potentially be eligible for brownfield funding? It could be. Is there any um, historical coal mining or anything that happened on that site, Bob? Uh, so are you talking about the the site um, that the university owns or the site that, that Rachel mentioned? Um, on four mile near near the the uh, borough of California, either I'm one. Not, I'm not sure if either site has had any uh, any coal mining, though. I do know that the the hundred acre piece uh, that they have actually um, leased the leased out for um uh, for for gas, um, but I don't know whether that's ever going to happen or not. But I don't think any coal mining's been done. But I have to check on that. Most areas around here, I know the adjoining area, there's been a lot of coal mining, but on that piece, I'd have to double check. Yeah, the reason uh, Becca was interested in that is the Water Research Institute is also home to the Northern Brownfields Assistance Center, um, who are the current um, recipient of the EPA uh, Region 3 Technical Assistance to Brownfields Award. Um, so they're actually working in Region 3, um, providing any technical assistance uh, for brownfields. So um, the reason I ask about coal mining is because that's one thing that some folks don't associate as being a brownfield. Um, if it were, you know, a historic coal mining site that was pre-law, um, it actually falls into the brownfields category. And um, Becca, you might want to mention just some other things that kind of make a uh, piece of land potentially fall into a brownfields 
um, yeah. category. If you guys aren't familiar with Brownfields, Becca can give us a quick Brownfields 101. Yeah, super quick 101. A Brownfield is a piece of property that might be contaminated. So a lot of different examples include um, abandoned mine lands, abandoned gas stations, abandoned like car or automotive like repair shops, things like that. Um, sometimes vacant lots, lots, especially depending on historic use and the Brownfields Assistance Center and or uh, WVU tab, I put a link in the chat to the website. Um, WVU tab is the technical assistance Brownfields provider for EPA Region 3. So those of you in Pennsylvania can request consultations for free uh, with WVU tab and I help out with some of that as well. So I'm like a little bit familiar, but I'm not an expert. However, I work with the experts. So uh, we would be happy to help and talk to you more about this kind of thing, because not only can we help you like discuss funding opportunities, but we can also help with things like design assistance. Um, what really caught my attention was when you were talking about it being 100 acres. And I was like, if that's a brownfield, that's something that some of our design students who help us out like and help communities for free are looking for larger lots of land and it's really difficult to find brownfields that are that big so um yeah feel free to check out that chat um yeah okay and, thank you yeah thank you <laughs> all right we'll put joshua on the spot yes I wasn't really looking too much. I was just more or less joining on to kind of see what was going on. I just recently started getting your um, newsletters and saw the link in there. So I just want to see what it was all about. Good. We're, we're happy to have you. Yep. And it looks like Callie jumped off before we had a chance to put her on the spot. So maybe something else came up for her. Yeah, she actually mentioned in the chat that she had to hop off for another meeting, but we'll definitely reach out to discuss waters more and to share info mm -hmm. on WVSOS Volunteer Assessment Database Upgrade Project. She thinks this could be a good area to collaborate. So look forward awesome. to seeing more of that, Melissa. Okay, 